All right, yeah. This is um, a paid power request from Liz. God damn, he not watched any other than the documentary. I suppose he was interviewed little bits in that, but not like this. We've done like Rush on here and um, Neil Pitt. Um, but yeah, God Downey on George Strombolopoulos. Yeah, whatever. George Strom, we call him. But yeah, let's go. Just like Gordon Lightfoot, another one of this country's great songwriters, Gord Downey can be a man of few words. But wow, can he say a lot. Tons of meaning within the confines of a three-minute song. Hard to believe, but Gordon the Tragically Hip have been with us almost 30 years. The hip earned respect the hard way, working their way out of the clubs of Kingston to become one of the country's most treasured bands. And all the while, giving perfect voice to Canadian stories. Stories about our game. Our justice system. 20 years for nothing, well that's nothing new. Or the people of our First Nations. Now Gord's digging even deeper than usual. While he was writing the hip's new record, now for Plan A, his wife Laura was diagnosed with breast cancer, an experience that made him want to completely rethink what he'd be doing as an artist. This is before him, then. Please welcome to the program, Gord Downey. Nice to see you, man. It's good to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's, it's good to be here. It's, um, like, I mean, a, a hip record is a cause for celebration at any time because it's beautiful. We get to go down this road with you. And then, you know, recently seeing The National in your interview with Wendy Mesley, then there's this whole other thing that comes with it. When you got the word about your wife's diagnosis, what, tell me, what, what was that avalanche like? Um, well, I was going through my notebooks, uh, and I keep notebooks for things like um, groceries and um, pithy comments um, with which to, you know, regale you. <laughs> what to say to George, dot, dot, dot. And I remember going back to that day just the other day, perhaps in anticipation of this, and I found a list of things that I had to bring back. We uh, have this farm up by Kingston, in Prince Edward County on the lake. And uh, the list was just all these things I had to bring back to the city because we weren't going back there mm -hmm. um, anytime soon. And my wife had split immediately. And I was actually out on Maine Duck Island, 17 miles out in the middle of Lake Ontario, which everyone should visit sometime because the water, it gets very shallow out there. It's 12 feet deep and the swimming is incredible. It's like this oasis that no one knows about. It's the lake that raised you. Yeah. Anyway, I was out there, no communication. I got back, the house was empty. and. And um, so I had a list of things to bring home from pads to socks to the toothpaste on top of the thing by the thing <laughs> over. And um, so that was the first avalanche. And um, you're kind of happy for those kinds of lists to keep yourself um, busy and occupied and, uh, and, um, and useful. When you write lyrics and you know that it's apparent in, your, in this. I have to say that was a heavy question straight out the gate. For the record, that you're saying things, kind of letting people know that your family have gone through something, maybe continue to go through something. Was there any, what was the decision process like to, to put that in there? Because you're an intensely private man, and this isn't an abstract thought you're putting out here. You're talking about nurses, you're talking about very direct things. What was that decision process like for you? I couldn't really, um, I couldn't really do anything about it. You know, I was writing, I wanted to, uh, there's a lot of emotions, you know, anger, fear, uh, impatience. Impatience is a big one. Um, love, you know, 
you're just uh, clamoring to, to help. So, um, you know, when Laura was um, free and clear, uh, we went, got back into it in the studio. Um, it's sort of hard to write during, because uh, that felt, you know, I don't know, somehow not right. I don't know. I was taking little notes, maybe. But um, once she was free and clear, we went into the studio to finish the record, which had been put on hold. Um, uh, everything had to achieve a standard, I thought, of uh, reality, you know, and illusion wasn't really cutting it. And to the extent that I have contributed to the illusion machine all these years, um, and to the extent that I tried to extricate myself from the illusion machine now was very basic. You know, I wanted to write um, fairly clearly, openly. Um, but having said that, um, I still write the way I write. And it maybe is not entirely obvious, but I thought it would be obvious to the people who know to whom it would be obvious. For the long, I've sort of, my friends and I have lived a life between certain lyrics from, that you've written over the years. For the longest time it was, for a good life you just might have to weaken. <laughs> And on this one, it's, there's got to be more than just despair, or just despair. Where did that one come from? I'm just um, one of the many things that a man tries to say uh, to his wife who's going through this, like so many of her friends are going through this, a woman that's made all the right decisions, eaten all the right things, exercised right, um, and is trying to make sense of it. Um, and, uh, you, you know, uh, I'm trying to matter. I mean, because she would, you know, listen to and go to almost anybody but me. My jobs were very menial and very um, basic. You know, get my chickens out in the morning and get them in. And, um, but on the moral support side, I, I fell short a lot, you know, That's which maybe only a husband can. It's an interesting thing about the conversation around breast cancer is because you, you obviously hear a lot about it from the context of the woman, as you should, and the family. But are there a lot of systems in place for what a man should do, what a man can do, what a husband can do in this scenario, or a partner in any way? Well, I think a man should be just satisfied with the little joys that sacrifice can bring. But a man should also only consider those things long after the fact. Um, because in the middle of it, it's useless. And. Um, you know, um, yeah, I mean, my wife's health and happiness is its own reward, obviously. Right. And, um, and yeah, that's all I really care about. But I don't know that the support group for men of women with breast cancer, it might have to wait till we figure this one out. You know, I'd rather be part of that support group trying to figure out why, um, you know, does it? I mean, you've always been a staunch environmental supporter, community supporter. You take a look at communities all across this country that are going through unbelievable assault on an environmental level, which contributes to, to the, the poor health and lack of well-being for many people. Does that just sort of solidify your anger in that respect? I don't know if it's anger, but I don't know that you can go around and cut environmental assessments where a community is allowed to sort of assess the safety of a project. I don't think you can gut the Fisheries Act. I don't think that you can throw over science and research for ideology, you know, and not expect there to be casualties. There will be blood if you're going to do that. Right. Toxins go to the fatty tissues, and everybody knows that. Yet it appears that that's where we're at in a lot of communities. What do we do about that? Well, just what we're doing, I guess. You know, my friend Alan Gregg was talking about it today in the Toronto Star and social network is, you know, it's got to be good for something beyond, you know, and it's never been easier, quicker, easier to mobilize opinion and support for things. Um, but that wouldn't be, you know, that would be a, that wouldn't be a bad thing to try to see if that works right. in mitigating the amount of breast cancer. 
you know. You play a clip that's where the, you know, where the hip goes and the things that they do. Take a look at this from not that long ago. So there's uh, Dora and the band. They're at the Great Moon Gathering. What was that Northern Revolution you're on stage with? Northern Revolution. The best part about that, I believe that the that video was filmed off the, from the phone from a mother of one of the people that was on stage with yeah. you. I mean, just that's what a trip that must have been for you to be up there. You with Joe Boyden, right? Yeah, and the band. And Joe asked us to go up because he was the keynote speaker. And would we come up? And in that particular case, they asked me to sing Knocking on Heaven's Door, and they were pretty particular that it was the Guns N' Roses version. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, no problem, you know? <laughs> and I was like, no, it's, it's different. And, um, and then they told me that their singer, uh, whose name is eluding me right now, I got it wrong on the evening too, <laughs> and said it about seven times. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they wanted to, they told her to take a, a seat so that I could sing the song. Right. And I was like, you never throw over your singer. What are you doing? She's your singer. <laughs> she's coming up here with and us. She's like, no, it's okay. I, I can't hit the notes. And I was like, well, then you'll come with me. <laughs> and then I said, okay, okay, cool. And, and then it was like, um, and then I introduced her onto the stage by her wrong name. <laughs> 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 she didn't hear it, dude. I bet you she heard it right, no matter how it happened. What's mm -hmm. You must have people that can figure that out. <laughs> we can figure that out. The, uh, do you feel like an elder statesman in some respect? That was a, it? kind of a fake. <laughs> Uh, Spit take is the other option. So you, I like the one you chose. <laughs> Neither. Elder statesman. Um, hmm. Musically. No. No. I mean, I'm still trying to... I like challenge more than expectation, more than meeting expectation. That's kind of dull and tiring. So the idea of kind of going out and challenging yourself and either playing to people that have never seen you before or doing things in front of the people that have seen you before that they've never seen before. <laughs> made sense <laughs> so I like that how do you figure that out because you said before that you're you're up there and it's, you're on this ride but do you ever study some of the other people do you ever look like look for inspiration in unique places well I was reading something today John Cage uh, was talking about and um, I thought it sort of applied about how well he didn't put it this way but I extrapolated that you know, songs are only half finished when they're recorded, that you have to perform them to finish them. And I thought that was, I feel like that's what's going on every night, that you're still trying to finish this song. You know, he also, the stage is like this, is the underlying question at which you're just throwing solution after solution after solution. But again, I'm extrapolating from this book I'm reading about John Cage. Maybe the book is only half finished when yeah. the book is yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. And it's, well, I thought that's sort of, you know, I'm looking for those kind of reasons because why would you do this? What are you trying to do on stage? And, you know, I get uh, at risk of sounding, um, I was going to say immodest, but, you know, I've read that I'm, uh, I have goofy stage antics it's and that I rant, I have these rants. When I worked at a rock station in Canada, your Killer Whale Tank version of one song was the most requested song I've ever, like, I, it's never been anything like, and it was just this moment. Right. Do you know when you're on stage and you're going down that dark alley? <laughs> well, no. And, but I do know that I'm planning on, you know, having a beginning and a middle and an end and finishing somewhere. I'm trying to be cognizant of composition. So when I'm, you know, up there, it, it, it doesn't, uh, yeah, weird, goofy rants. And that's all that, it just stops there. And I'm like, well, you know. There's, a, there's a, something at work here. Like I'm trying, I'm trying things. And on stage, it all makes sense in, in terms of music and dance. Like I love, I love dance as an expressive form, as being able to express yourself in that way. You, uh, so. you know, uh, the last song is called "Goodnight Atahualpa's Cat." On this, it's why that first of all. Why that title? Why that song? Well, I think it was inspired, well, it, I don't think, it was inspired by our visit to Fort Albany. 
I like the image of a band going up there to play. It's a fictional band called the Silver Poets who show up and, hey, we have, we're not here, to, we're just here to get paid. Right. You know, I mean. Are they like the constellations, these other fictional bands you go with? Yeah, I like fictional band names. But, um, so yeah, we're just up here, and, but we're here, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and we don't think that you're just, that you're not on the way. You know, that you're a fly-in, fly-out community and, and that you, you know, we're here, you know, we're here to play. Um, beyond that, I mean, you know, if you read about the communities along James Bay, uh, Western Shore there, you know kind of what they're going through in various forms and ways, you know, and you reconcile that with the people that you meet. And um, everyone's like you and me, they're except way funnier, you know, way cooler. And, um, and way tougher. Yeah. But, um, and gentler. And uh, anyway, I'm maybe not painting an accurate picture, but at least I'm trying to paint a picture right. that isn't the picture that we all just sort of accept and, and forget about. And That's what I wonder. You have this, I don't know, I would, the word responsibility, but that's not the word I mean, but it's somewhere in that space, the idea that of the big bands that tour this country, the bands that can fill arenas in this country, there is, you can count them all on one hand and you're one of them. But you're the only one that on the surface is so overt about things in Canada at this stage. In the way that, you know, you travel the country, people have never been to Bob Cajun, but they know what it is now because of you. A lot of people got to know the Milgard story because of you. Do you, do you recognize that very few in the pop rock space, whatever that is, are doing that, that are naming cities, are naming towns and telling Canadian stories, and that's one reason why you do it? Mm. Is, sorry, what's the question, George? Oh, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sorry, but... Uh, you um, do it on purpose. The place names and... Yeah, just the idea of really reflecting. Yeah, but never once to be patriotic or nationalist, like never once, even when I was younger. Roseanne. Roseanne. That's her name, Roseanne. I'd like to call Roseanne to the stage right now. <laughs> you never throw up your singer, she's gonna help me sing. <laughs> Knocking on heaven's door, put it together for Roseanne. <laughs> before we get to the, uh, You're before, good. What did you? That's good. Before we get to that part, what did you call her? Roseanne's not that hard. I, it was, the music was loud. There was a band playing before, and we were side stage, and we were really nervous, and the music was blaring. I was like, you're nervous because it means something, <laughs> you know? And uh, <laughs> what's your name? Rosa. And I, I, think, I think I was, oh, I don't know, man. It was like, it wasn't Roseanne. <laughs> Rosette. I was calling her Rosette. That's close, man. That's, That's no. That's close. <laughs> Rosette. Why didn't she kick me in the nuts? <laughs> Seven times. Too, just. <laughs> Rosette. Okay, so you. I'll pause it there a sec. This is a very like. I didn't actually expect him to be quite as honest as he is. And not that I thought he would be deceptive, but I mean like, like the type of creative he is it it can cause people to be that's why they write that's why they do what they do is because that's their way of saying things that aren't comfortable for them to say and just talking um well i found it really eye-opening when he said he f he fell short of the moral side of looking after his wife the moral support that's surprising to me like and, and that was an extremely honest thing to say extremely honest right yeah that was surprising that was surprising but also i do think well it's why like because i started getting into rush and then rush led to the tragically hip and gore downey but that was the kind of what I knew going in with 
this band is that they were a Canadian band. They were very much like, say, the a Cold Chisel from Australia and um, the Kinks over here, where kind of America turned their nose up at them. So they them bands kind of turned around and become a an Australian band, and and the Kinks started writing more English based lyrics, but. With Gord Downey and the Tragically Hip, they were a Canadian band. They had no interest of anything else other than Canada. And I think it's great that he puts, um, he puts Canadian towns and things in his songs because it's. He's right. There's a lot like me. There's a lot of people that don't know Canadian towns, and he's saying these towns and, and kind of giving a light and a, and also making a kind of romanticized poetical magic to them so yeah but i have to say the stuff with his wife was jesus that was and to know that he went on to then have cancer himself like he dealt with that pain through watching his wife deal with it and then having to go for it yourself, which I'm sure he was more than happy to for it to be him and not his wife, but still, like, two on the trot, like, I don't know whether his wife was still alive when he got it, or, or what, but that's a lot to, um, kind of hit a family and hit the psychology, but I kind of, I liked what he said about mundane tasks being kind of what you need in that situation a kind of something to get up and put your mind on and not dwell on things and, and menial even menial tasks of, of getting a list of things your wife wants or your wife needs and it it's giving you that feeling of and also for men um it's very hard for us to kind of know how to support in that way because we've never had it done to us and we've never done it to anybody we've never had this like we it, it's it's a very strange thing for a man because we just it's not a muscle that we work out that much but it's not a fault of men it's a fault of the society that men grow are, are in like no one really takes that with us so and you don't really know how to kind of be there for someone in that kind of sense because there's very few men that's actually had that in their life <clears throat> but for him to yeah I thought that was a very brutally honest thing to say that he felt he fell short of the moral support that's a yeah, that's brave to to sit on and kind of say that. But anyway, two seconds, I'll be back. All right, let's carry on. Let's go. You consciously wrote about these places, but never to be patriotic. Nationalistic, like even when I didn't know any better, I knew enough to think, well, you, 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 it's a beautiful country, it's a big country, and it's a free country, and it's a place where you can decide what you think the country is. And... Um, and for that reason, it's, it's full of ideas, full of starting points, full of discourse, you know, full of, um, full of shit. <laughs> are, you, uh, are you familiar with the Ken Spencer Science Park? I'm not. Okay, you know who those two are? At the Ken Spencer Science Park at Science World, there are two chickens. One is called Gord, the other is called Downey. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> Does it matter which? Uh, it's which? No. No. I don't know. I actually tried to figure out which one was Gord. I, I got to think Gord is on the right. I got to think, but I don't know. How do you wow. feel about that? I'm still processing it. <laughs> Big news. Yeah. Gord and Downey. It's just, it's just an odd place that you guys have been because I know, like you said, challenge is important to you, so you do. 
I guess, try to just to make it feel like a first record, a second record. It, it doesn't feel like a legacy band to you, does it? No. I mean, and practically speaking, this record we recorded like, uh, like we did when we were kids, like, like kids do. You, and primarily, entirely because of, um, because we had to put everything off and put everything on hold. So we knew the songs very well, which is what kids do. Um, and we went in and knocked them out in uh, 10 days, which gave it a, which is what I always prefer to do, because you can become very estranged from your own process, you know, where you actually don't know how to make a record. You're relying yeah. on other people. Right. But it I kind of worked entirely because I went in and was able to, um, in the performance, just give it all the emotional oomph, the, you know, the, the rafter scratching uh, emotion that I really needed and wanted for it, for these songs. Is that because, like, you gave Roseanne the advice? Is it because it meant something? Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought, I'm not going to conserve. I'm not going to leave anything on the table. I'm just going to use it all up and, um, and pack it with all those feelings I have of love for my friends and my bandmates and people that supported us, our friends, uh, here and gone. And uh, I just really wanted it to be that, to be ample and grateful in every way, which is two words I'm fond of. And um, I wanted it to show. We're pretty fortunate where we don't know from night to night who we're going to be playing to. And it doesn't seem like we're exclusively a college band, which to me is great. You know, because uh, sometimes in, in the college gigs, you know, you're up there and you wonder if you're basically a backdrop for, you know, some big huge beer up or something like that. And that can be more frustrating than playing to no one. <laughs> Nineteen eighty-nine. My concerns are the same. <laughs> are we just a backdrop for some beer up, <laughs> George? Is it always bad though? No, no. no you take it where you can get it. <laughs> What's the best city for live music in this country? As has been your experience? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Not saying they're all bad. No, no, they're all good. Um, best city. I'm sorry, it's just, how much time do you people have? Uh, I'm going through province by province. Uh, <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> I don't think he means that. <laughs> Your favorite memory from childhood? Oh. Favorite memory from childhood? <coughs> uh, mm. Well, it's a pretty obvious one. Um, when the Bruins won the Stanley Cup in 1972, really? my brother and I went out onto the... It's too obvious, right? Well, if, uh, as a Habs fan, it brings me pain, but carry they on. They beat the Rangers. <laughs> they beat the Rangers. I was uh, eight, and my older brother and I, he was 12. We went out on our driveway and danced in the rain. And uh, it was a Sunday afternoon, I think, a Saturday afternoon, May 11th. And, uh, and we were just shocked at how eerily quiet it was. <laughs> there was nobody out. It was just us. It was one of those ones where we just sort of stopped dancing and walked back into the house. <laughs> It's, uh, it's not unlike the Stanley Cup celebration in Carolina or Anaheim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two guys on the street, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you appear to be a, a pretty balanced guy. What's the one rock star thing you just do where people around you got to remind you, hey, pal? Um, well, I mean, that's the type of thing I'm trying to banish. From uh, you're talking about so when what I would call an artist is different than what another like a person a record company would call an artist, which would be petulant, whining, demanding, right. a pain in the ass artist. Yes. Um, New Year's Eve on the turning of the millennium. Remember the Y2K? Uh, we did a big thing, and 
we had this big balloon drop that didn't work. It, it was supposed to come out of the mouth of this dragon, and <laughs> uh, it didn't work. Uh, the stage was littered with balloons. Um, someone had left the back door open to the rink, and it was like this Arctic gale was blowing through the stage. And for me, as a singer, it's like for singers, it's not good. You want it warm, you want it humid. It's beautiful. And cold air makes your voice go and so you can't actually trust what you're gonna sing. And I kept asking them in between songs to close this effing door. And, uh, you know, it was beyond everybody. It might not even been a door. So my reaction to that was to, I fell on a balloon and it went pop. And there, I'm telling you, there's like 8,000 balloons on the stage. And I decided that I was gonna fall on every balloon <laughs> with my body and kill every, and I didn't stop until they were all what are you broken. Doing? And the entire, and it was a of rage. It was nothing artistic about it. It was, I was trying to sort of, <laughs> I'm gonna kill these balloons. Right, and, uh, and I was, you know, the whole Yorick and, and slam on my, and just throwing myself, and it got ridiculous to the point where I think the crew were all in tears. Not from laughing. Not from laughing, <laughs> like, wow, I'm witnessing just the, the worst blowout I've ever seen. If, uh, if you were to stand... So I don't do that anymore. Yeah, it's done. That's done. If you were to stand near the ferry to Wolf Island, near the K-Rock Center, where would you be standing? Number one, the tragically hip way. The tragically <laughs> hip way. Paul Angwa said that he doesn't drive on that street late at night because he doesn't want someone to accidentally post a picture of Facebook on him on his own street <laughs> late at night. Do you ever just cruise that street just because? Um, well, we happened to be on it this summer. We were going, I think, to Paul's house, actually, with my kids. And we were at the stop sign I didn't even notice. And my wife said, hey, look. And the kids thought that was actually pretty cool. But I realized I hadn't even mentioned it to them, um, probably because it was such a nail-biting city council vote to decide it. It was that close? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. 7-6. <clears throat> <laughs> You were hoping for more of a slam dunk. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, no, you won that. Yeah. But it's Kingston, and it's they're very, they consider things carefully and carefully. Right. Well, listen, congratulations. Uh, now for plan A. It's again, it's another great record, man. Well done. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Go down, everybody. Glad to go here. And go back. Yeah, that was a great interview, because I think it showed kind of every kind of side to it deep side was it introspective um sad human honest funny kind of like his music really it kind of yeah his music you get all them kind of things all them kind of emotions in his you have his kind of in your face but then, yeah yeah that was a great interview great interview and i bet his kids did love that i bet his kids did love that because it's like say say someone like 50 cent now to the world 50 cent super famous but he says about his little boy he's like he thinks i'm a superhero as he saw him perform once, and he's like, um, he he's like, he couldn't believe it, a crowd of people, and I think, yeah, as a kid, things like that, like seeing your dad's band <laughs> get a name, but also you want that too, you don't, especially with council and them type of people, official people, you kind of don't want to be liked by them in that kind of sense so I think it's good that they had a close call with it not being called that because it shows that there is that edge and rock and roll to the band but yeah I thought that was a great interview he does do good interviews his mate the ones with Neil Peart about his motorcycle tour um, the ones with Rush oh, they're the only ones I've seen I think I think I've seen him with anything else I was going to say as well, is it every Canadian into sport like that? Because obviously one of 
uh, uh, my all-time favourite Canadians is Norm, and he loves sports. But then Gord Downey followed that story up by saying him and his mate or whatever were the only two people out there dancing in the rain, and no one else cared. So it does seem like Canada is just like everywhere else. Um, but yeah, great interview. Great interview. And definite, like... To be fair, it was kind of what I expected him to be like. Clever. Um, you can tell he's just clever from, like... Even from where he goes with questions. It's always somewhere that you're... At least in this... It was it was never somewhere predictable he was going with answering questions, I don't think. But yeah, great interview. But yeah, that's the reaction. Sweet.